all sorts of good stuff. We wanted to take time to have people, um, hi, I'm JJ, by the way. Good morning. How's everybody doing? Good. Uh, we wanted to take time to just highlight, you know, it's like, uh, you can call it the menu or the, the whatever, but we feel personally called and responsible as a church to not just like be this place where people go, but to be this family, this group of people walking the same direction together um, in our city. And that just means like uh, this whole Christian thing, for those of you that maybe have been doing it for a while, you've been walking with God, you know this is true. It's easier to do with others. Loneliness is the, the epidemic of loneliness in our world. They actually can measure it now. It's the loneliest time we've ever had in the world. We've never been more connected, apparently, but we've never been more isolated and lonely. And it doesn't just change. You can't just be like, oh, I need some friends, man. <laughs> um, because everyone's kind of, the world is walking together in this in this thing where we're like isolated we're so into our own things that unless you stop and purposefully cross paths with other people you find yourself Sunday through Sunday kind of alone on especially on the inside that's how you can go to church with people for years and years and years and years and never get to know them anyone ever experienced that it happens it's the default mode of humanity what takes effort but is always worth it is finding ways to cross paths with other people that are about the same stuff. That's what life groups are. They're an intentional crossover with other human beings that you are moving in the same direction with. When I say moving in the same direction, I'm like they also are trying to follow God and walk with God in their lives. And it, it's going to look similar and different than you. But we get together and we talk about just life. We talk about the messages that are on that we have on Sunday, a few application questions, just be like, hey, this was said, or in this scripture that we read, this is what King Asa was going through. Like after last week, I got a bunch of text messages of people just being like, man, that really spoke to me. And I'm like, that's awesome. It spoke to me too. How did it speak to you? We talk about what, that's, that's life groups. It's very street level and easy to be a part of. You don't have to know a lot about the Bible to have God be working in your life a lot. And we need places where we can just be like, hey, you know, I'm going through this, and has anyone ever else experienced that? That's what life groups are. They're so important that I seriously think every person in this room should be in one. And you know me, I'm not much on selling people stuff. I just don't think... The, faith that we don't want to sell people like but I believe it in enough that it's helpful and so these are our life groups so basically you look at all those people and you just judge them from your seat and then you're like I'm gonna go to that person's group because and you chose it by what snack they're gonna do so let's we're gonna have a prayer of repentance real quick where we apologize to God for judging people based on what they're gonna give us um, and then the same thing with, with Aaron and what he's uh, going to lead some men through. So that's going to be for, for, uh, for guys. And we just believe for such a time as this, God has, has uniquely placed us together in our city in this time with this group of people. And how best can we implement the things that we have been entrusted to serve you guys? This is what we feel like. God has opened the doors for. So we have eight different groups to choose from. They're different geographical locations, different times. They're all on the back table. And um, I would love to see, you know, the church stats say, if you can get the best, the churches that are best at life groups, how many, what's the percentage of people you think sign up for life groups? The churches that like, they just kill it at life groups. It's like the best thing they do. How, what's the percentage of people do you think that are involved? Spit it out. 30%. 30? I hear an 80. Did someone say 80? 
Okay, 80%, 30%, any other guesses? 50, what was yours? 20. Pessimist. <laughs> right there, just kidding. Uh, if you can get half of any group of people to be like, yeah, I'm down with that. Apparently, that's like a huge win. And so it depends. So if, you, if you're a glass is half full person, you're like, that's good. We got half our people involved. Um, the, our best season last year, um, we had about a third of our people involved. Um, I'm believing that we could do better because last year I've had more people be like, they didn't want to stop life groups in the summer because it was so rad. So anyways, that's the, the last we'll say about that. And um, we'll, we'll meet the rest of the life group leaders next week. So start thinking about it. Talk to your friends, the people that are sitting next to you, and um, sign up for one. I really think um, you'll be blessed. Okay, can we pray and then get into the Bible? Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you um, for this study that you've... I don't know, just been leading us through, through this book, um, Second Chronicles. It's really cool to look at people's lives that lived 900 years before you did, Jesus. Before you became a human being and were born on earth, You've always been, so you've been speaking and working in people's lives. And we're looking at lives from 900 B.C. And it's like they're our homies from today. We're like, yeah, me too, with all that, with their lives. So, Lord, thank you that your word is living and active, and it does stuff in our lives, and uh, if we want it to. And, Lord, we do. We want you to have your way. We want you to be our teacher and to teach us. We want you to be our king and lead us. We want you to be our savior and save us from ourselves. So we open up this time, and we ask that you would bless it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay. We are week three of what we're calling 10 Kings. It's the third week of a 10-week series. Um, we have been passing out we passed out bookmarks. Mine got destroyed already. <laughs> Way to go, Cole. <laughs> that dad messed up. We're in the, the third week of a 10-week series. We passed out bookmarks. They're on the, the back counter and the connect corner, if you want them, the idea is each week as we talk about a king, you can write down the name of the king because they have crazy names like Jehoshaphat. And then you can talk, we can write down, like week one, Solomon. Solomon was wise. You could say he knew better. That's what wisdom is. It's not knowing, it's knowing better. It's knowing why. Applied knowledge. What was his downfall? He was driven by lust. His lust took him to places that it shouldn't have. It took him to uh, cool places. He built crazy stuff. He was really driven, but it also took him to places that were very bad. And there was application for us in that first week. And whatever you wrote down for me, but or whatever you wrote down for you, but it had me thinking like um, the things that God has blessed you with are the things that the enemy tempts you with. That's what I wrote down. The second week was Asa. We talked about him, and he, is, he was amazing. Man after um, did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Uh, Asa was desperate. Do you remember he, the word last week was desperate? When he was inexperienced, he was very desperate, and he called upon the Lord, and God answered him. His shortcoming was that as, as he got some years under his belt, he became... Um, less desperate on God, and he kind of figured he could do it on his own. What did it cause? It caused, caused a lot of bitterness later in his later years. So one that was so joyful, and he ended like pretty bitter. So whatever that spoke to you, stay humble, stay desperate. 
Keep moving forward. Keep listening to godly wisdom. Keep asking questions. Don't act like you know it all. However God spoke to you, the idea is you jot it down on your bookmark. This week we're going to look at a king named Jehoshaphat. The title of today's message, I went back and forth. I always try to take the big theme of what we're talking about and I bring it into one or two sentences. It helps me grasp what I'm going to talk to you about. It also helps me grasp, like, this is what, this is the, what's being talked about. So, did my best this week. I'm going to call this week's message, Dangerous Game. It's a dangerous game. Jehoshaphat, we'll get into our text here in just a sec, but his life is a good one for us to look at. He was Asa's son, so after Asa that we talked about, came his son, Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat, Ram, should we call him Jojo? <laughs> Jehoshaphat, fatty. Fatty. <laughs> I ain't doing that. But you know his friends did. The ones on the inside circle. Fatty. Um, <laughs> fatty reigned for... He took over the throne when he was 35, okay, 35 years old. He reigned until he was 60 years old, so 25-year reign. His father, Asa, 41 years. Jojo, 25 years. When you look at his reign, one thing that really stuck out to me, we're going to be in 2 Chronicles uh, starting in chapter 17 is where we're going to start. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and turn there. Second Chronicles 17. But one thing that really stuck out to me about Jehoshaphat's reign was how many alliances he made. How many alliances he made. That's why I call it a dangerous game. Alliances are a dangerous game. We're going to do a quick run through through his reign because I want you to see the big picture of it. So we're going to cover a lot of years quickly. And then at the end, I want to make it, we're going to take and we're going to be like, okay, Lord, so what, what are you saying? What are you showing us? And we're going to make just a couple of application points at the end. We'll think about a couple of things because this, this one is good. It has me thinking deeply about my life and and. And stuff like that. So in 2 Chronicles chapter 17, I'm going to read some verses, say a few things, and kind of buzz through, um, buzz through some of the scripture. It says this in verse 1, Jehoshaphat his son succeeded him as king and strengthened himself against Israel. Remember, the northern kingdom of Israel, they were at war with. If, this, if you're new here today, we're jumping into something we've been talking about. What was a united kingdom has now been divided. And the, they were at like in a civil war that lasted um, a couple hundred years until finally they were fully both wiped out by another empire. But they were at war. The south versus the north. We're following the kings of the southern kingdom of Judah. So... Jehoshaphat strengthened him, himself against Israel. He stationed troops in all the fortified cities of Judah and put garrisons in Judah and in the towns of Ephraim that his father Asa had captured. Basically, all the border towns, they were, when you read a town, that it says that they are fortified cities. They had a wall around them. That's what that means. So all the cities that had extra protection where you could put guards on the walls, you would fortify those cities and make them strong. That way, if someone came against you, you could shoot bow and arrows at them because that's what they would do. Okay. The Lord was with Jehoshaphat because he followed the ways of his father David before him, and he did not consult the Baals, uh, the gods, the pagan gods of the time, but sought the God of his father and followed his commands rather than the practices of Israel. Verse 5, the Lord established the kingdom under his control, and all, and all of Judah brought gifts to Jehoshaphat, so that he had great wealth and honor. 
verse 6, his heart was devoted to the ways of the Lord. Furthermore, he removed the high places and Asherah poles from Judah. High places and Asherah poles are places of worship to false deities, gods, um, in the world at the time. So they would be like other temples or other places where people would go. They're often outside high places, mountains, uh, even people who aren't walking with Jesus or can call themselves Christians will say they feel close to God or something on top of a mountain. There's like a reason, these thin places that they, maybe they're called, that, that there's just a sense of worship there. That's why um, people can worship the creation versus the creator, right? So the first part of his reign, you could say this, Jehoshaphat focused solely on his alignment with God. He was aligned. He wanted to be aligned with who God. He fortified the cities. Lord, help me to serve these people. Take care of these people. Protect these people. That's what his focus was. The first part of his reign um, and under his leadership, he was aligning to God the best way he knows how. And we see that as we continue. Verse 7, in the third year of his reign, he sent his officials. And there's a bunch of hard names, but here's why he sent them. Verse 9, they taught throughout Judah, taking with them the book of the law of the Lord. That was a book at the time. It's called the book of Moses. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. The first five books of the Bible is known as the law. It's what they had. It was written. It was in scrolls, and they would go, and they believed it was divinely inspired by God, and it taught you how to live, how to have a rule of life. This is what it looks like to be a person of God. To have, um, to have a rule of life, rhythms of life, to be aligned with God as a people and as a nation. That's, that's what he was doing. So these people went around, these priests and teachers went around and taught people. It says, the fear of the Lord fell on all the kingdoms of the land surrounding Judah. So like all the countries around were like, dang, what is happening over there is powerful. It says great fear fell upon them, like we ain't messing with them. Whatever, they, they may not have all this power and all this stuff like they used to, but whatever is happening, it is evident that there is like a, a power. It's a supernatural thing. You guys realize that God does supernatural things in our lives, not just makes us like better looking and gives us more money. Like he does stuff where people are like, dang, there's something about what's happening in that person's life. That's the God we serve. And so it says, these other countries were so, they took so much notice of it, they actually brought like gifts and paid homage to Jehoshaphat. And they were like, yo, friends, alliance, can we be friends? We don't want to mess with you guys. That's kind of what was happening. Why was God blessing them and what was happening? I think this first alliance that we look at is because it wasn't about what the other kings of the world were doing. Jehoshaphat just wanted to focus solely on what God was doing. It was about doing what he was supposed to do, pointing his people toward God, being faithful with what was in front of him, and it's evident God was blessing him. Then chapter 18 tells us this. Now, so all of this happening, now... Jojo had great wealth and honor. All these gifts, all this stuff, being faithful, his alliance, his, like, Lord, show me attitude of it all. Now he was balling. The kingdom was doing really good. He had great wealth and honor, and now he allied himself with Ahab by marriage. This is not the pirate not the captain. That comes much later. Captain Ahab? No? Ahab, so Captain Ahab in Samaria. So this is the other kingdom. 
Ahab slaughtered many sheep and cattle for him and the people with him and urged him to attack Ramoth Gilead. Ahab, king of Israel, asked Jehoshaphat the king, Will you go with me against Ramoth Gilead? Jehoshaphat replied, I am as you are. My people are your people. We will join you in war. That's how you make an alliance. Your people, my people. Your army, my army. Your goals, my goals. Your battle, my battle. Made an alliance. But Jehoshaphat then said to the king of Israel, First, let's seek the counsel of the Lord. Ah, oh, this is worth taking note of. Still young in his reign. A lot of success so far, honoring God. Then we see this decision that's made, this alliance that comes. He aligned himself first now to Ahab, then to God. Did you notice? Your people, my people. Your army, my army. Your battle, my battle. But let's seek God too, just to make sure. We need to understand who Ahab is and the situation that he was in before we were like, what's so, what's so big deal? What's such a big deal about this? Well, you can read all about Ahab in 1 Kings chapter 16 is one of the chapters. If you want to get a good um, 30,000 foot shot of him, go there. But let me just read you two verses about him. In 1 Kings chapter 16, verses 29 and 30. In the 38th year of Asa's reign, so Jehoshaphat's dad, 41-year reign, towards the end of his reign, Ahab, son of Omri, became king of Israel. He reigned in Samaria over Israel 22 years. Verse 30, Ahab, son of Omri, did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those that had gone before him. I had a bunch of verses I wanted to read you because in just like 15 verses prior to that one, it talks about three kings that had ruled in the north and each one was successively worse than the first. So the first dude reigned for 12 years, I think. Then he was killed. The second dude reigned for seven years. Then he was killed by the next guy who reigned for two years, who was killed by the next guy who reigned for seven days. They make whole TV shows about this type of carnage and the lust for power and how people will not only disagree with the policies of the person before him, but actually believe they'd be better off dead and have them killed. And people that would come in Dude, this, the one guy before him came in so hot that he stole the throne and then he had the, all of the people that could threaten him for the throne, the previous king's sibling, had their whole family killed. And all it says about Ahab, he was by far worse than all those dudes. That's what we know about him. And there's a lot more, but that's all you need to know. And then we have Jehoshaphat who did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, but then goes and makes this alliance. Not the best track record. And Jehoshaphat would have been very familiar with all of this because he took over the throne at 35. He was being groomed to be the king. So it's not like he was like, yo, what's up with this dude up north? He would have known and seen the patterns of death and destruction and all of that stuff in the northern kingdom, and yet he makes this alliance. He knew what was up. He knew better. He knew, but the situation that Ahab was in was this. He had gotten defeated by, did you get that map that I put in the notes? Yeah, I didn't think so. It's okay, because I don't remember if I, I didn't know how to send it. Let's be, let's be honest. <laughs> I was looking at it, and I was all, save. <laughs> Anyways, Israel is this little piece of land, okay, surrounded by, and this, the, the kingdoms of the time, if, if you have your Bible, sometimes in the back of your Bible, there's maps and stuff, so you can kind of see what was happening, but instead of other countries, there's other kingdoms, okay, and they're always fighting for land and territory, 
So Israel split in two. So they were half as strong as they once, once were. And then both sides were surrounded by all these other kingdoms. So Ahab was getting his butt kicked on the north from kingdoms trying to come in and take over. He lost a bunch of people. So he's trying to fight to gain some of his land back. Or he lost some land. So he's trying to gain some of his land back at his farthest northern border. So he's like, let's call Jehoshaphat from down south. Let's see if we can get him to fight a battle that is so far away from him that you'd be like, bro, why are you even there? That's what the whole thing. So he gets him to come up and fights. Jehoshaphat gets played. That's what I'm trying to say. And we see it right here, chapter 18, verse 28. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, went up to Ramoth Gilead. The king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, this is, what Ahab, this is Ahab's battle strategy. Hey, I will enter the battle in disguise, but you wear your royal robes. Yeah, he's like, I'm going to hide. I'll put on a costume. You go out there and look like you're in charge of all these armies against our battle. Do you know what the, if you want to get rid of a beehive, what is an important bee to get rid of? If you want to demolish an army, which is the most important person to kill? The king. He's like, I'll tell you what, you be the king for the day. I'm just going to wait over here. You get all the glory. So the king of Israel disguised himself and went into the battle. Now the king of Aram had ordered his chariot commanders, do not fight with anyone small or great except the king of Israel. He didn't even want Judah. When the chariot commanders saw Jehoshaphat, they thought, there's the king of Israel. So they turned to attack him. But Jehoshaphat cried out. I wish I could have heard that. Lord, I cry out. And the Lord helped him. God drew them away from him. Thank you, God, for your grace. When the chariot commander saw that he was not the king of Israel, they stopped pursuing him. But someone drew his bow at random and hit the king of Israel between the breastplate and the scale armor. The king told the chariot driver, this is Ahab, get me out of here, away from the fighting. I've been wounded. All day long the battle raged, and the king of Israel propped himself up against his chariot, facing the Arminians until evening. Then at sunset he died. I wish I could tell you all that's going on because it is so fascinating. It was prophesied that Ahab was going to die in this battle. It was told him because when they said, uh, maybe we should seek God. All of Ahab's people were like, go to battle. You're going to kill him. It's, it's going to be fine. And then Jehoshaphat was like, are there any prophets up here that are legit? And Ahab goes, there's this one guy, but I hate him because he always says bad stuff about me. <laughs> and, and Jehoshaphat's like, go get him. So they go and get this guy, Micaiah is his name. And they bring him in, and he's like, yeah, and Micaiah is kind of feeding him. He's like, yeah, you should go to battle. It's going to work out great for you. And then Ahab's like, see, this guy drives me crazy. And then the, this prophet says this. He's like, you're going to die in this battle. So Ahab comes up with this thing, all, all dressed in disguise, this and that. And what happens? He dies. The chances of someone at random grabbing a bow and hitting armor perfectly, bet scale armor, that folds over itself in the breastplate underneath to where it hit him in the heart. It's like a, an impossible shot. But God does impossible things. And, he, and the dude was so bad, it was his time to go. That's what was happening. One of the things I love about Jehoshaphat, though, is that he learned from his mistakes. It says he went back. Um, and he had more faith in his later years. He learned from the mistakes that he made as a young man. Can, can, are there some of us in this room that can say that? We should. We should be able to. Like, Lord, thank you for your grace. I, I learned from that one. Jehoshaphat learned. It says this. When Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, returned safely to his palace in Jerusalem, he was like, yo, get me out of here. What am I doing? Goes home. He gets back. Then one of the prophets in his kingdom says, went out to meet him, and he said, should you have helped the wicked and loved those who hate the Lord? That was ouch. It's like, he's like, I, I know, dude. 
Because of this, the wrath of God is upon you. There is, however, some good in you, for you have rid the land of Asherah poles. You have set your heart on seeking God. So Jehoshaphat lived in Jerusalem. He went out again amongst the people from Beersheba to the hill country, and he turned them back to the Lord, the God of their ancestors. He appointed judges in the land in each of the fortified cities, and he told them, consider, so he appointed judges, people like judges, court judges, and he's like, listen, this is what he told them. Be careful what you do, you guys, because you are not judging for mere mortals, but for the Lord, who is with, who is with you whenever you give a verdict. Now let the fear of the Lord be on you. Judge carefully, for with the Lord, our God, there is no injustice or partiality or bribery. Oh, bro, could you imagine if every judge who ever lived took these vows from their heart? They want to, I promise you, judges want to administer justice. But could you imagine if everyone trembled before God and said, God, you alone, you know right and wrong. Because how does God judge? No injustice, no partiality, and no bribery. Like what happened in Jehoshaphat's life, it was a wake-up call. And he was like, I need people in my life to shoot me straight that are real. And he was like, we all need that. So one of his biggest uh, social or, or political reforms was to appoint judges in all these places that could help people bring their problems and their issues and the, into the judicial system and we, he could help they could help he appointed godly leaders throughout his kingdom again and then and it says and God gave him rest and things were going good again and it was awesome but then life did what freaking life does After this, chapter 20, 2 Chronicles says this. After this, the Moabites and the Ammonites and some of the Meonites, so now, who are these ites? These people aren't on the far northern border of the northern kingdom. These are Jehoshaphat's next door neighbors. These are the kingdoms right to his, if you're looking at the map, his two o'clock, his four o'clock, and his five o'clock. Three kingdoms on the land side of right on the other side of the Dead Sea. Right there. They came to bring battle against him. And it says, from the other side of the Dead Sea is already in this town, that is in Gedi, which means they're already on this side of the Dead Sea. They should be over there. They've already reached to this side of the Dead Sea. They're coming, dude. And their forces are strong. And we're freaking out. And Jehoshaphat, verse 3, alarmed, was like, resolved to inquire of the Lord. And he proclaimed a fast for all of Judah. The people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah to seek him. And then it says... Moms, dads, children, everybody came to seek the Lord. Jehoshaphat didn't, look and go, didn't go looking for trouble. This time, trouble came looking for him. So Jehoshaphat sought a new alliance, but not with the king of the north. He sought it instead with the king of the universe, which is awesome. The king of heaven and earth. He proclaimed a fast, and he called all the people to gather and pray. He was like, well, it says this. And then he prayed, Second uh, Chronicles chapter 20, read it. There's a prayer in there that is so awesome that it was written and preserved for us to read. How would a king pray if he was going to be decimated from, these, from the king's kingdoms next to him there's all these people and he is going to be the no, known as the king that lost it all how would he pray well we can see how he prays because it's in chapter 20 word for word but he says this he he prayed a verse that he learned as a child in awanas 
Some, some people laugh. That's good. Other people are like, I want a what? Some tacos after church? It's like stuff you learn to memorize scripture as a child. Do you remember what God told David? If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves before me, I will hear from heaven and I will heal their land. So he's praying and he says this, If calamity comes upon us, Lord, whether the word of the Lord or judgment or plague or famine, we will stand in your presence before this temple that bears your name and we will cry out to you in distress and you will hear us and save us. He was praying scripture back to God. What's how powerful a scripture? It's life. God knows his words, the promises he makes. That's why we pray and we speak his words back to him. So he stands there and he prays this. And then he prays something that is one of the reasons we're doing this 10-week series. I read it this summer. And I was like, now I've been saying it. I'm like, somebody else thinks this too? Something I've said over and over and over just in my heart. And I still continue to say, but this king said it. It's so beautiful and raw and powerful, and this is what he says. It's a half a verse. Doesn't even get a whole verse. It's a half a verse. Verse 12, chapter 20. He prayed this. All this stuff, long prayer, and he says this. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. You ever felt like that? God, I don't really know what to do, but I'm, my eyes are on you. Like, Open for you to do something. I don't want to make these mistakes that I did as a kid. I don't want to be that person that I was. I don't want to make those alliances. I don't want to go back to that vice. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that. I want you to do something, but I don't know what to do. That's the best prayer. It's the scariest prayer, if you've ever made it. You, you make it, and you're not like, this is awesome. You're like, this is the worst. And then God sees us through because that's what he does. And then we spend the rest of our life trying to never be that desperate for the Lord again. <laughs> You're like, people say, I was never so close to God as when we were young. We were so broke. We lived paycheck to paycheck. We just needed God to work in our lives. And then now we're just so excited that we like don't want, that we don't need that. We're like, Whew, glad that's over. But remember, like Asa, we never want to get the spirit of desperation that we always live with. God, we need you to do something. Here's was God's response to that prayer. Verse 15, a prophet spoke to Asa after and said, listen, King Jehos or to Jehoshaphat, and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem, this is the Lord's word to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged of this vast army, for this battle, this one's not yours, but God's. It's, this, it's, it's as if God was saying this. When you were young, you went looking for trouble and you found it. But this time, trouble came looking for you and they're going to find me. That's why I said this is called a dangerous game. See, life is a dangerous game. There are dangers that loom around every corner. When we go looking for trouble, holler if you hear me, we find it every time. But even when we don't go looking for trouble, it's like trouble comes looking for us. Danger is part of the deal of this life thing. Trying to just live to avoid it. I was on a bike ride with a good friend yesterday. We came back. He, had, he was cut up. We ended up pushing our bikes up the side of this mountain going, I think there's a road up here somewhere. And he's the type of person that's fun to get lost with because you were just, we're going to figure it out and it's going to be fun. But there's blood involved. And I was just thinking as we were doing it, I was like, you know, danger, a little bit of danger is such a cool thing. We don't want to do stupid amounts or like where we're not calculating things. But danger where you have to focus and you have to come to your senses and you have to be aware of what's going on. 
and aware of the alliances that you make. I had a good alliance with my bicycle, not with the tree. But there's just a dangerous aspect in life, whether you want there to be or not. And so how you go forward with that information dictates a lot of how you handle stuff, who you seek help from. So that's the, his thing. Let me hit you with these couple of things to think about, and then we'll finish up for the day. The first one is this. Alliances bring alignment. That's what I was thinking. Alliances, the things that we align ourse- uh, make alliances with, we line up with in some way, shape, or form. Alliances with the world are very dangerous because they pull our hearts and our minds away from the things of God and places them solely on the things of this world. Jehoshaphat, I got to line up with this king because he's more powerful than me. I got to line up with this group of people over here because they can make me uh, get what I want. I got to align with vi- with money. I got to align with status. I got to align with likes. We got to align with all these things because that gives us our, we, we end up lining up to those things that we make alliances to. But we have to be reminded like Jehoshaphat knows, and we're told in Ephesians chapter 6, our struggle, the real struggle that we're fighting, it's not against flesh and blood. That's the devil trying to psych you out and get you to settle for fighting with people. Settle for fighting with family members and fighting with different groups of people. But our real fight is not with flesh and blood. But it says it's against rulers, the authorities, powers of the dark world, and against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. What does that mean? It means there's an alliance behind the alliance. We make agreements and alliances and and we align ourselves with demonic things. May look good, like with Solomon, it may glitter, but it's a lure, just trying to hook you and pull you in a direction. Alliances are powerful. Be careful because the things you make alliances with, they bring alignment to your life. Who are you aligning yourself to? The second one is this. Rule of life, rhythm of life, the stuff we talk about, it matters. It really, really matters. There are battles that we face that we don't have to. Jehoshaphat knew this. That's why he sent priests all throughout the kingdom the kingdom, to teach people God's rule of life. We don't have to go down every gnarly road, have our teeth kicked in, and then be like, dang it. Again, there are patterns and rhythms in our life that can help. I don't have time to do it, but Romans chapter 8 is beautiful with rule of life stuff. It's deep, I'm going to warn you. Like you read it and you're like, what? How? Just read it again and again and again. And then you're like, oh my gosh, this literally talks about what it looks like to be led by God in my life. Those who are governed by the Spirit, not by the flesh, who are led by God. Romans chapter 8, some have said the most important chapter in the whole Bible. Last two, how you enter the battle matters. See, the first battle Jehoshaphat entered, he was wearing all these robes. The other guy was hiding out. You know how he entered this southern, this one that came knocking on his door? The prophet said, you go out there and fight them tomorrow. God is with you. But you're not going to have to fight. God's going to do all the fighting for you. And he, he believed him. He's either stupid or he really believed God's word. And so he lived like it. And so it says he woke up the next morning. And he believed so much he put the worship team at the head of the band. Because maybe he was mad at him. He's like, let's put the worship team up there. It says that he established people, the, the, the rule of life that they had was they were going to be in a spirit of praise. 
and they put all these people, they were in charge of the spiritual temperature of the nation, put them first, and the army led to, to singing. When they arrived to the battlefield, everybody was dead. Because the enemy armies ended up turning on each other and fighting each other because they battled against flesh and blood. And it says it took them three days to gather all the spoil. God was just like, way to trust me. It's pretty sick. So the third thing is this. How you enter, bat- how you enter the battles of your life also matters. That's why we need to do this thing together. Because how we enter these things really matters. Did you... Do you, put, do you do like Ahab does it and put other people out in front of you to take the shots? It's not my fault. They did it. Or do we do what David did when he was younger and he wrote Psalm 100? Do we do what they did here and we did this? Be, put praise before the battle. Why do we sing at the beginning of church? Because praise comes before the battle. We put God in his proper place. That's what singing does. It's not like that song was dope that we sang today. Um, How great is our God? It took me back in time to a place in life where I was like, God was doing fresh work in my life. It was really cool. That's why we sing. It puts God where he deserves to be, on the throne, in front, in charge. Praise brings God into the battle, last but not least. Alliance brings alignment. What am I aligning myself up with? What alliances am I making in my life? Rule of life matters. Monday through Saturday matters. The way you go to work matters. How you start your day matters. How you end your day matters. This is not like religious bondage I'm trying to put on you. Because you can do all the right things and still have a crappy day. And still get in a fight with your spouse. And you may still be feeling um, burdened. And then what happens is the devil's like, well, you're just not doing it good enough. They don't do it good enough at that church. You, they, you need to do this better. And you need to do that better. And he wants to make our outcry of our heart for God to work. He wants to turn it into religious um, exercise. Well, you can't pray like that. you got to do this better. You need to cut your hair. You need all these weird things. It's in God, and then he turns what God was once beautiful and fresh, and he just turns it into like legalistic weirdness in our life. That's not what that means, but it does. It's not what I'm trying to do, but I am trying to say you can live with purpose and focus and rule of life matters. The last one, you are stronger than you think. I just think we need to be reminded all the time. Some of you in here right now, you feel like your life is running you over and you need to understand what Jehoshaphat knew. You are stronger than you think. You've just been aligning aligning your life to things that tell you you're not strong enough. You can't do it. Someone's got to do it on your behalf. And I think the Lord just be like, dude, enough is enough. When you go looking for trouble, you're going to find it. But when trouble comes looking for you, they might meet God Almighty. How sick is that? Our weapons are mighty, the Bible says. So I want to read this last verse, and I'm just going to close in prayer after that. And then we'll sing this. Um, We'll sing a short version of this last song, and then we'll we'll, uh, get on to the ladies lunch and stuff but all of that being said Jehoshaphat's life let me read these couple verses and then um, let's pray no it says in all these things we are more than conquerors through Jesus who loves us In all the battles and all the trials, we don't just win, but we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, 
neither the present nor the future nor any powers nor any height or depth or anything in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that we can look and see how someone lived the mistakes they made in the way that you brought people into their lives, the way that you spoke to them, the way that they grew, and the victories that they were able to come to where we are. Then when we get to the New Testament and someone like Paul writes those verses, we know that he was not just drawing on personal experience, but he was looking at the very same scripture that we're looking today, and he was like, nothing can separate us from the love of God. The world could be chaotic. We may be facing stuff around every corner, but Lord, we are yours. We who have submitted our lives unto you, we, we place our lives in your hands and we say, it is not I who live, but Christ who lives in me. We know that with that comes trials, comes all this stuff, but nothing can take us out. We are more than conquerors in you. Thanks for the reminder. May, the, may we walk this week, Lord, with just a spirit of um, not cockiness, but a spirit of um, confidence that my life is lined up. Battles may come my way, but God's got those. He's going to fight for me. Thank you, Lord, that you're actually that involved and you actually care that much. And if there's anyone in here, Lord, that is in the place where maybe they've been fighting battles that they've gone looking for and you're telling them it's time to stop, um, I pray that they would hear your voice and that they would take one step towards you today. So we love you. We thank you for this awesome weekly rhythm we get to have. And just in response, Lord, we lift up your name with this song in Jesus' name.